Louis, when I first came to Faversham just over eight years ago, and I mentioned somebody I like fish, they said, you've got to go down to war and see Bluey. How long have you been here doing this? Oh, bloody. I think hollow shore fisheries was set up by the father back in about 1961. 1961? We've, we've, been, we've been in Orr and Faversham for... Since I packed up fishing in the North Sea, right. which was a, about the, the what, late 60s. What were you fishing for in the North Sea? Fish fishing, you know, we yeah. fished for what was available. And how have quotas changed since then to now? We didn't have any problems in them days. Right. Right? We didn't have a quota problem. You could just fish what you like. This has come about with Europe. But were people responsible? Would they fish something to death then? Are, the, are quotas needed in principle? Or? Um, markets, you know, markets demand, yeah. market, the market demanded the fishing effort. Right. Um, you know, if, if fishing was generally heavy and the skipper would have a link call with the company ashore and they might say, well, don't go to Grimsby to Hull or whatever, it's bogged down with one thing or another. Right. Or change, go somewhere else and catch something else. But it was all market forces that controlled it. And your dad set up here in 1961. When did you join him? I joined him about so six years, seven years later. Right. And then these two youngsters, they came in when? Quite quickly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the yeah, no, that's right. <laughs> yeah, I'm King John. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you had a magic. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want that on film? <laughs> yeah, I yeah, think yeah. I look alright. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Julia's <laughs> laughing. Can you see him in the shop? <laughs> I won't ask which one's old. <laughs> we lived um, in number one Hardy Ferry Cottages in the early days. You know, we've worked from the from the swale. A lifetime. So you really were seven, Fiona, when you first yeah. went out with your dad properly? Yeah. Yeah? And, and our pocket money, skinning soles and filling in herrings and whiting. <laughs> Mind you, we had to watch for three years before we were allowed to touch a knife. So we right. had to... So you didn't have the knife till you were ten? No, we <laughs> had to watch and take it all in. Right. And, I mean, at the age of 12 or 13, I had a dinghy in the... And an elbow, so I used to go shrimping in the creek. There was a creek up and down the creek. And what did you do with the shrimp when you got them back to you? Just to put them in the dark, Dad used to cook them at the, down at the when we lived down there, and then they used to go to market. Right. So you were sizable quantities, you weren't just getting a few yeah, like no, most kids. I mean, uh, sometimes I'd get eight or ten gallons on a, on a yeah. day tide. Yeah. Fantastic. Yes. And, and the shop, which we'll get, we'll get to look in later, but the shop, when did you have them there? Been here eight years now. Right. I mean, we had the little shop much the same oh, at number one Hardy Ferry yeah. Cottages. Then we had the shop in the um, town. Um, but we were only open in the evening in them days when we come in from fishing. So you go out fishing all day, yeah. then come back, have tea, go and open the shop? Yep. Well, that was, I mean, people just used to come whenever. Yeah. If they knew, we, if the boat was on the mooring, they knew. they knew we were at home, yeah. and they would, you know, they would come and knock door, and the wife would go and serve them, or maybe I would have defended who was available. And what sort of things you catch now, what did you catch then, how's it changed? Yeah, very much. It's, um, perhaps I shouldn't go into the into my own views about the change. No, no, it's, it's, it's you were interested accepted. in hearing from, yeah. But, you know, life in... The inshore areas has become quite impoverished in places um, in re more recent years. As as the waterside corridors have become more densely populated and developed, you know, then we we've noticed a, a decline in the in the, the smaller feed things like shrimp, um, prawns, flounders, and you know, Anguilla vulgaris, the common eel, which is now not common. Really <laughs> quite dangerous. But um, the finger normally was pointed at us, but you know, we've had to fight in the courts to 
to try and get clean waters, basically. We've been threatened with prosecution and, and one thing and another, um, and it's cost me thousands, you know, to get the powers that be. So it's and pollution that's pollution damaging the rivers. A big so it's, it's the opposite of the Thames, for example, where I grew up as a kid. Um, if, if you smelt the river, it would kill you. Um, it was full of things we can't say to that machine. But now that it's clean, I've seen salmon. I've seen salmon. I'm sorry, I let you say that. <laughs> it looks clean. It looks but clean. it's got it's got salmon in it that big at uh, Tower Bridge. No, nah. We used to catch salmon here. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I've got pictures of him yeah. holding salmon. Yeah. Yeah. We don't get from... salmon anymore. Not here. Yeah. And I mean, the only reason there was a few in the Thames was because Basically. about 25 years ago that they actually in, tried to introduce a run of salmon. Right. But for the few that are coming up since, it wasn't very successful. Um, and I don't believe... I know from talking to other fishermen, if you talk to fishermen my age, people like Paul Gilson, right. who fished a lifetime and his family in the Thames, they'll tell you the same. You, you, you see them out there with clean, the rods, but we're, but we're what, stick, we're stick to swale. <laughs> what, 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 what do you mostly catch here now? What do we mostly catch now? Well... Whatever's in season, really. Right. But yes, just not but in such abundance anymore. It's, our quotas are very there. small on whatever whatever we're allowed to, to, to fish for. Um, we still have a reasonably good skate fishery on the Kent, Kentish Flats. Right. And, I mean, skate seem to have weathered a lot of things quite well. But they're a migratory fish. And when it gets, you know, to really hard times, they, they're they away. And they're away for several months and then they'll work back again. And where, the where, where would they go to when they get away? Where do they go? They move to. Our, our fishery on the North Kent coast is very shallow. Right. And it's susceptible to temperature. Yeah. And weather controls everything. Whether you're in fisheries or agriculture, weather is the law. And everything, you know, is affected by the weather. And as temperatures drop and the food chain semi-comatoses or goes into the ground and hibernate, then, you know, the fish that feed on that, they move away to the deeper layers where there's a bigger volume right. of water and temperatures right. are higher. Yeah. Now, you, you, last time we spoke, you were talking about, um, and Fiona was talking about, off-quota fish, things that aren't covered by quotas. What sort of things are we talking about? What type of fish? Flounders. No. Flounders are covered. Dads are covered by quotas now. Yeah, but not quotas that we can't, they're not quotas that we can't deal with because of what we catch. Right. We would, the, the market for that kind of fish is so low that, it would probably cost you money to go to sea if you was just going targeting that species. Right. But they are a species that um, that we do catch a lower end of market fish. Grey mullet. But grey. Right. Grey mullet. Another brilliant sales of mullet over the last few years have really increased. Um, you know, maybe a quiet taste, but a good, good fish. And we smoke it, and we do lots of different things. So you, you, ca you catch so the mullets. You catch it all in nets. Mallet, I think, is am I right in saying it's got a very soft mouth. That's it. And if you try yeah, and catch it on a line, you can well lose it. Yeah. Smelt. Smelts are a good one. Smelt. Smelt. It's a salmon. Smelt. It's a salmon. It's a member of salmon family. But we catch a lot of those through the winter time. Say so they're a really good fish. Chinese cook a lot with them, tempura batter, just inside them, pile, and bake them. So, 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 how big would a smell be? A big one like that? That's a large one. That's right. But smell a beautiful, freshly cut cucumber. And you catch them here and you sell them in the shop? You sell them in the shop. And, and they're trying to close the swale to make it into a reserve to look after. Oh. So, you probably won't be catching them too much So, when you say they, who's they? The powers that be, you know. Defra. Defra. Well, it's not only Defra, I mean, it's um, it's a whole body of up and coming marine biologists and experts from university. You mean, you mean theorists who've never caught a fish? That's yeah. the one. <laughs> 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 they caught a fish, that's exactly it. <laughs> right. 
So we could uh, we get a game could be as well could be hanging in the balance there to whether or not we will have any fishery left. Um, how many of you? How many fishing boats are there on this way? We are the only ones. You're the only one. We are the only ones. There's a few nomadic boats that visit. Yeah. But certain different times when they know there's a possibility of a particular. And 50 years ago, when your dad started, or just over 50 years ago, how many would there have been then? Um, how many would have been then? The heyday of, of my sort of fishing in the swale probably was around about the peak of the cod boom in the, the late 60s, the early 70s. Right. Um, I mean, we had two, two trawlers then. And my old pal who I paired with old Bill, he had a trawler as well. And Brian Burford worked from the swale. We, we, we probably at times there would be six or eight vessels all based at Hardy Ferry or some of them in the creek. And those that aren't here anymore, have they died, retired, or have they gone off to work in a factory or given up? Well, most of them have given up purely because they've not, you know, they, they weren't as versatile as what we were um, to keep up with regulations. Right. Um, I mean, we, I got, got into oysters many, many years ago. Um, I was lucky enough to work with John Bays, um, you know, Mr. Oyster locally. And, and so, so tell did. me about Faversham oysters, Louis. We, we hear a lot of marketing talk about Wichita oysters, yeah. which is only a couple of hours down the coast. Um, what's the difference between Faversham oyster and Wichita oysters? Well, Faversham oysters. Faber <laughs> I mean, it's a limited company that was founded in 1930. Right. But I, I mean, my, my own researches and talking to old timers that I knew as a young man right. who never had a job in oysters in Faversham because they were long gone from the estuary right. um, through other things that have created the demise of the flat oyster. But when I read through the shareholders list of 1930, I find that the majority of the shareholders actually were also shareholders in Bowwater's paper industry, which was part of the problem that destroyed the swale. Right. But, I mean, why... What, what the Faversham Oyster Company was created to do, it never ever did. Which was what? Well, was to create a fishery that was viable um, and supported the fishermen that, in the past, had had work. It, it, so it the, did none of the, it. the Faversham Oyster Company still exists? Oh, yeah. And who owns it now? Who are the shareholders? Who are what the do they control? <laughs> they <laughs> they, they the nature trust. Do they have any influence yeah. over you? The, um, the Ken Wildfowl Association. Right. Alan Jarrett, who I believe is the planning man for Medway, one of the planning officers, He's the chairman, or he was. Right. Um, and they sell permits for people to go shooting. They don't catch oysters. They never have caught oysters. So, but you no. catch oysters. We farm oysters. You yeah, farm oysters. Yeah. But we brought those oysters and then we, in. We introduced the Pacific oyster in the swale via John Bays. I mean, I bought, I bought the first two lots of babies from John. Right because he used to hound me and say, you fishermen reap without sowing. Right. Yeah. So in the end... It's taken 30 years. <laughs> I, I invested so let's, six let's come, back, let's come back to the question. What's the difference between a Faversham oyster and a Wisterman oyster? What's the difference? I was a far more suited. I'm sorry, I have to be about? biased. Meat, meat produce. Oh, We've got a fantastic oyster. And only this morning, one of my customers said, yeah, yeah, those oysters are just so good, mate. And they've been looked after properly. 
we thin the beds, we look after them, we, rot we, we rotate, we rotate from the same bed, we rotate, which helps us increase reproduce, yep. you know, reproduction of them from different types of fat and that to grow. And that's how we we work. We don't dredge them, so they're not stressed, they're not sucking in mud when we're dragging the crawl. Right. A dredge through them, we hand pick them at low tide, and they're hand washed. So you can only get a superior oyster if it's hand harvested, because oysters suffer stress when they're when they're dredged. Oh. You